views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee. You're watching Open. This is BXRX, and we've got it going on for you until it's time to quit. You ready? Kick off your shoes and relax your feet, because coming up on today's show, we'll be joined by a representative of an organization, an important health organization, as they share information you'll need to know this flu season. Then we'll highlight a singer and learn about her journey as a, a performing artist. And then we'll hear from uh, the founders of an organization that's trying to clean up our community, one organization, one neighborhood at a time. And then Bobby C, he steps into the room with the latest in the world of sports. And then finally, we'll speak to the pioneer of trap jazz and get a sneak peek at his latest project. So stay tuned, all of this and more. Headed your way, we'll hit you with a one, two, three punch. <laughs> and we're coming your way with open, wide open, right here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, how are you? I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS and of course opens channel 67 and all the other channels that we deal with. We are coming to you live from BronxNet's interactive programs. You can uh, stay connected to us through social media at BronxNet TV. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you today. So if you want to, you can just kick off your shoes and relax your feet. Today, we are joined by a program manager of Bronx Health Breaches Flu Vaccine and COVID-19 programs. And they're here today to highlight some vital information that you'll need to know as we approach uh, Influenza Vaccine Week. So it's right upon us. So please welcome to the show, Mariah Bernzeloff. Mariah, welcome. Thank you, um, Dr. Lee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell us, um, you know, you're so very welcome. You're always welcome. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you that before we even get into the interview. Um, tell us about your role uh, with the Bronx Health Reach. I know uh, it's a CDC program, so tell us a little bit about it. My role at Bronx Health Reach is to promote um, COVID-19 and flu vaccinations in the Bronx mm -hmm. to increase the number of vaccinations in the Bronx. And um, right now, we're as you said, we're promoting the um, flu vaccinations, and we're doing this through something called the Bronx Flu, flu Fighters Campaign. We're doing this okay, in the Bronx. Wait, say that five see. times real fast. Say it five <laughs> times real fast. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's flu fighters. I, I, when I first started seeing it, I was like, whoa, uh, the Bronx flu fighters campaign. <laughs> the Bronx, you know. Yes. So we're, I'm here to promote the Bronx flu fighters campaign. Yes. And the um, objective of this campaign is to increase the number of people in the Bronx who have been vaccinated for the flu. And yeah. really, um, we will be planning to achieve this by promoting um, flu vaccination in the Bronx, the importance of getting the flu vaccine, um, listening, really listening to people and addressing their concerns about the flu. We spend a lot of time in the community talking to people and listening, a lot of listening, not just talking, um, listening. And um, offering the flu vaccine at more locations and providing community outreach and education. Um, yeah, I, I was talking to a couple of doctors and um, they said, please get the flu vaccine as, as, as soon as possible so that we won't mix up the flu vaccine with the other vaccines that you need to take for COVID-19. So they wanted to get that. That was early on. Yeah, and I think um, especially this year, um, you know, we... We were very lucky last year because of the precautions that a lot of people were taking um, yeah. around COVID, staying home, and um, a lot of people actually got the flu shot. That we had a very high number. It was a record year of 35% more adults got vaccinated for the flu. That's 1.4 million people, um, and that was much higher than the year before, um, which was 
a little over 50% of New York City adults were vaccinated. This year, we are already looking, CDC has already reported that the number of adults getting vaccinated has decreased across the country. So we're really concerned. We don't want people um, you know, getting sick with a, a preventable illness, the flu, yeah. and um, keeping um, our ER um, employees and workers, healthcare workers, really busy when they could be treating COVID patients. Yeah, and um, you tell people who, uh, who's, who think that maybe, hey, I took the, uh, the COVID vaccine, I don't have to take the influenza vaccine, right. but they're I've, different. I've heard that too. Um, and what I tell people is that it's two different viruses. So yeah. even though there are a lot of similarities in the symptoms, um, they are two different viruses. So if you feel like you're getting symptoms of the flu and you're not sure if it's COVID or the flu, get tested, get tested, get tested. Um, yeah. We're seeing a decrease in testing of COVID and I really encourage it because it's the only way to know what, what's going on with your body. Um, and it might not be either of them. RSV is floating around. There's rhinovirus or the cold. Um, so there are a lot of, um, you know, respiratory illnesses um, bubbling around right now. And so it's really important also to just take care of yourself. People say, oh, well, I'm healthy. I take care of myself. Yes, do that. Keep doing that. You know, yeah. keep exercising, drinking water, getting enough sleep, eating healthy, all those things that are, those are really important. But vaccines cannot be replaced, unfortunately. Um, so COVID, getting COVID, getting the flu shot this year, um, please, please, please do it. What about that mask? Mask, I still think mask, masks are still important um, because we're not at the point where enough people have been vaccinated for COVID. In New York City, 76% um, of people have been vaccinated for COVID. And in the Bronx, 71%. So yeah. this is good, but we really want to get to like 90%. We want to get, you know, we want to get that number up um, yeah. so that until we do, we really need to continue to wear masks. And yeah. actually the numbers are of COVID cases are much lower in certain um, districts, in certain neighborhoods in the Bronx. We're still struggling. Um, but still don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard Don't down. let your guard down. Yes. Don't let your guard down. Please be careful. Now, influenza, what is influenza vaccination vaccination week? So influenza vaccination week, uh, it's a national um, awareness week to recognize the importance of getting vaccinated for the flu. Um, yeah. And we are doing this, we're celebrating this or commemorating it. Um, by having an event at Mount Hope Family Practice. So the, the launch of the Bronx Flu Fighters campaign is actually today at, um, at 12.30. There will be giveaways, um, food, and then from 1 to 3.30, we will have a flu clinic available. We welcome everyone, everyone, regardless of insurance, please come and get your flu vaccine. Um, and then going forward throughout the flu season, you can get your flu vaccine at one of our three flu community flu clinics mm -hmm. um, at Mount Home Family Practice, at um, Walton um, Family Health Center, and at Stevenson Family Health Center. Uh, and um, we'll give those addresses, I think, at the end. But and those will be on um, those clinics will be available on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And they can go to a website to get more information, right? And they can go to the website to get more information, as well as um, you can call me or email me, 212-366-0800, extension 1287. Um, I check it all the time. I'm happy to talk to anybody, answer questions, um, help you get an appointment. Thank you, Mariah. We appreciate you, and you're always welcome back. She's the, the program manager of the Bronx Health Reaches Flu Vaccine and COVID-19 programs. Mariah burns along. We'll take a break. We've got more open on the way coming up next. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at bronxnet.tv. Learn 
Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS, and we're on BronxNet. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We have uh, people that can sing. If you're into music, I have this classical artist who does her thing. She's from Harlem, and she was uh, the last time I saw her, she was at the New York City Marathon. She came on just before the Jeff Fox Band, when we had that performance by Mount Morris Park. And she's a friend of Phyllis Sheldon. Yes, indeed, and she's here with us today. Give her a big round of applause. She sings that music, and she does her thing. Clarissa Senseno, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Still singing like that? I Last sure I heard am. You, you, you throwing down. Through, through the pandemic and all, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right through the, because a lot of people have stopped. Were, were you a little more creative when the pandemic, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, uh, just that people don't, a lot of people don't treat it that way anymore because of the vaccinations and but we still have to be careful. But are you still doing your thing through the pandemic? And has yes, the pandemic I, ended you in any way? Um. Oh yeah, greatly. Um. I'm not doing any live performances at restaurants and stuff like that. But I did. Um, my my both my children, Jordan and Jalen, are also artists and singers and composers and writers. What? So I, yeah. So I built. Now, Phyllis a, didn't tell me about that. I just I <laughs> want to, but I didn't know you had. What do they sing? Um, my daughter is more like a, uh, fusion, jazz fusion. Uh -huh. My son is more R&B. Um, yeah. So, so they yeah. have yeah, infused R&B, classical music and, um, jazz. Yes. We, we definitely could do, do, do something. We need to do something together. They do something together, but, um, yeah. I would love to do something with them as well. Um, and bring yeah, it to the world famous Apollo theater. That's exact. That would be perfect. That would be perfect. Yeah. Um, but I built a studio in my house. And so oh. with doing that during the pandemic, it kind of relaxed things, of course, because if you know, you have young people who are in their twenties, it's a little sticky when they want to get out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, get, so you build a studio, music just integrates everybody all over the world. It's a universal language. So I'm sure your youngsters who are in the music business want to go down there and uh, gravitate mm -hmm. to a studio. Oh yeah, they, they were, and my son was in there like all day, all night. <laughs> My daughter didn't miss, um, but pretty much the studio was always occupied. Yeah. And then um, this summer I did uh, jazz under the stars in my backyard. Woo. So we right. 
we had um, a few people over we, with, with keeping COVID and six feet um, in mind and also, you know, making sure that temperatures were right. Um, even though we were outside, uh, uh -huh. privately invited certain, certain folks who RSVP right away. Um, opened it for everybody, but you must RSVP. And then we chose 25 to 30 people. And so that was perfect. That was perfect. And you were standing out there with a thermometer. <laughs> no, I had a full staff of people. As soon yeah. as you come in, you know, like you have to come in through the gate. We have a big parking line in the front. So that works. Yeah. And um, in the backyard where we come in through the carport, it's a locked gate. So can't sneak in and then we charged a fee uh you know minimal fee of like 10 bucks and oh. that, yeah we, we charged 10 bucks and then yeah. we also had um a caterer who charged for food so yeah, it was pretty cool. do. people used to charge for house parties back in the day all the time yeah. exactly so um you know the cost went for the band we also had a porter party Fabulous porta potty. And then Phyllis brought a pallet. Phyllis in her backyard had pallets full of hand sanitizer all over the place. Did she we had that. We <laughs> had that. That's what you do. We, you know, we're creative. Uh, you gotta, you gotta, you know, do what you do. That's make it right. work. Yeah, make it work so, for sure. So you tore it up, the kids sang too? Um, actually, we played the kids' music during the break. Uh-huh. But we had a full live band with um, Paul O'Day. Oh God, who? Um, uh, Baba Don, Baba Tunde, uh, Tom DiCarlo, oh, yeah. Mimi Jones, uh, Louise Perdomo. Who else? I can't even think. Um, oh yes, Cook, Brodax. Um, Dwayne. Wait, who's that young man back there? He plays the piano, doesn't he? he yes, that Paul O'Day it. plays the piano. Paul, Paul, stick your head in there. Hey, Paul, how are you? Okay, how you doing? Yeah, you're gonna do a little something? Tink tinkle with keys uh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. do a little right. something. Yeah, just yeah. do a little yeah, hit me with a touch. Hit me with a touch. This is live <laughs> on Zoom. Here we go. It may not sound exactly the way you want it, but we'll get some in there. We'll definitely fit in the stream. Here we go. Ready? A three, a one, a two, a one, two, three, four. But that's oh, how you do this. Top of my head. <laughs> All right. Now, now hit a little, hit a little piano, and she's gonna sing. Ready? Yep. Okay. We can do, we can do that little nature boy, little okay. song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very strange, enchanted boy. They say he wandered very far, very far over land and sea. Little shy, but sad am I, very wise was he. This is what he said to me. What did he say? What did he say? The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. Be loved. Ah. Uh, yeah. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Cool, thanks, Paul. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> this uh, is Clarissa Senseno. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Your piano player, Paul, Paul O'Day. Paul O'Day. <laughs> Any day, Paul. All day, Paul. 
That's what they call me. All day, all day, all day, all day. All day. There you go. Where can we get more information on everything that you're doing? And uh, if you got stuff on that website, if it's a website uh, that shows where you're going to be, maybe we come on down. If it's a lounge, we can sit back, kick off our shoes and relax our feet and sip on a glass of water. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, You will find everything on www.clarissasinceno.com which is my name, Clarissa Cincino. You can Google it and go right to the website and it has everything on the website. Clarissa from Harlem, Harlem World. That's it, born in Harlem Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Clarissa, thank you so much. You and too. Tell Phyllis I said hello. Tell so Phyllis much. I said hello. Yeah. Okay, definitely. Give her a virtual hug for me. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> All right, love you guys. Okay. All right, we'll take a break right here. More open on the way. Don't move a muscle. Here we come. Everybody, I'm the Doc Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS in BronxNet. Here we go. We've got it going on for you. Our next guest is the co-founder of the Anti-Litter Project. They join us today to speak about their organization's efforts to end littering and improve street cleanup. It's a wonderful campaign. They're doing it all over the place, and we thank them for their service. Please welcome to the show, Jennifer Seda and Dexter Thomas Payne. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Bob. What's going on? Nice to see you. I was mentioning street uh, cleanup because well, I was a part of the street uh, cleanup pan- campaign back in the day for 92 KTU, uh, 99 XWXLO that turned in from 99 X to 98.7 KISS FM and mm-hmm. uh, BLS. And they had a tractor trailer out there and they put the sound on both sides of that tractor trailer flatbed stage. And we were going around to different neighborhoods cleaning up. We mm-hmm. called it the, the street cleanup campaign. Wow. So you got to let us know how you guys did yours or how you guys are doing yours. That's definitely. I'm hoping we can bring that back. That sounds kind of yeah. awesome. Yeah, fantastic, right? We'll make it bigger and bigger. Yeah. So yeah. you guys conducting yours, l- let me see how we can, uh, we can slide in and join. Music would be helpful. Yeah. I'll tell you that yeah. much. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we, uh, we luckily we have some good resources and some good people around us that have been able to kind of help us along the way. Um, the yeah. hardest part is like getting the tools because you know yeah. it's not easy bringing a bunch of shovels and brooms and stuff. But yeah. once you have have people and you have good energy, the rest of it is really easy. You know what I mean? And yeah. Especially importing the tools too. That's one of the hardest parts when you don't have a car in the city. Yeah, we used to use a shopping yeah. cart uh, to <laughs> just to get from like you know one side to the other, or whatever. Yeah, like, hey, you know, you gotta you gotta get in where you can fit in. If it's just a shopping cart and a few shovels and brooms, you gotta do that. And just you know, you can go a long way. You can clean yeah. up a whole neighborhood, you know, with some just a shopping cart with some shovels and some brooms. Yeah. Yeah. How did that's you guys how, get into it? That's how it really started, yeah. Yeah. How did you we, get into it? We lived in the South Bronx, on the Merrill's area, mm -hmm. right by the old courthouse. It was a lovely South story. Bronx, South Bronx, South yeah. Bronx. South Bronx. <laughs> fun, man. Our backyard was literally like the old Port Morris, like, um, train, like the railway. Um, yeah. So we, we lived. Yeah. It was just, um, it was a problem area for a trash pickup. Yeah. And it was a really big littering spot, an illegal dumping spot. You could walk out of the building and you would just see bags of garbage. Oh, uh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a lot to deal with because we had just got there. and We understand that this may be a problem that is way longer than our time yeah. there. But it seemed to bother us a lot. And we had a third roommate at the time. And we kind of put our, our mind, yeah. minds together and we're like, hmm, what if we kind of, I don't know, what if we just helped? What if we did it? What if we did it ourselves? And did I have Go ahead, go ahead. At the time, um, sanitation's budget was cut in the middle of the pandemic, too. So we yeah. really weren't getting much help. So we kind of just turned to each other, you know, for help. Our super, uh, Mark, Martin? Martin? Martin, man. He was a great guy. I seriously. Oh, yes. Martin. All right. The super. <laughs> the great guy. Martin super, is super. He yeah. had a bunch of buildings under his um, supervision, and uh, he did it. Every morning, we would see him out there by his damn self. And, when we saw that, we were like, all right, not only can we help the block, we can help him. We can yeah. make it, try to inspire people, you know? Yeah. We should send a turkey over to Martin. Yeah, Martin, yeah. here's a Thanksgiving turkey, you know, for helping doing some, yeah. doing some wonderful things that you've been doing all, you know, throughout the years. Yeah. yeah. You know, you have to, you have to praise people like that. And thank you guys for joining in and rolling up your sleeves and getting out there and taking care of business to help yeah. other help the lives of other people, you know, making things look beautiful. Yeah. And what we realized was like, nobody wants the litter on their streets. It's just like, no one wants to do it. No one wants to be the per first person to do it. And the thing was like, people should get paid for it. And the people who are getting paid for it are not picking up the garbage because of these, you know, budget cuts or whatever. So right. how it really started. Yeah. So who's helping out now? Do you have the Department of Sanitation or Housing? They they have those trucks that can come by. You can load them up. And they can take them down to the dump or whatever. How's that working? So the good thing is we team up a lot with Sanitation Foundation, which is like a nonprofit of DSMY. So we basically use DSMY and Sanitation Foundation for them to bring out the tools, for them to table the event so and we don't so, have to transport the tools. And the hardest part is to pick up the trash. After you've collected, mm. you know, 25 plastic bags of litter what do you do with it wow yeah yeah somewhere disposed of properly and those are things we have to learn as we went that trash disposal is a is a strategy if you do it the right way it'll mm -hmm. get taken it'll get yeah but if you it kind of just sits and lingers you know yeah so oh. we basically communicate with dsmy like whenever we have a trash you know pickup day we'll put it by a litter, a litter basket and we'll tell them specifically where we put it so they can pick it up that same day. So it's not sitting out there for pets to go through it. Yeah. yeah. Are you guys looking for volunteers or funding to help you with your foundation? Always, always. We, we're, we're a grassroots organization. You know, we don't get paid for this. So we understand that yeah. not everybody wants to give of themselves or even give money. But what we do like is outreach. We like people who can vouch for us, people who can just... Yeah people we do and learn that like we're here to help you know what i mean volunteers yeah, are you, need, you need funds for like the wheelbarrows and the you know supplies yeah. garbage cans and plastic yeah. bags and all that yeah. thing, all that stuff costs yeah we have a gofundme and um our gofundme gofundme link is on our social media and i will say soon we'll be releasing some swag that will help us also fundraise when it comes to getting more tools and everything merch what is the gofundme page what, what is it What's it called? 
So I think it's the anti-litter project or clean up the Bronx. I can't we haven't looked at it in a while, as you can see. They got the website though, right? With, with, yeah, with it's they... on media on Instagram. Okay. So it says uh, the litter project, anti-litter project on Instagram? Yeah, so you can follow us on Anti Litter Project on Instagram, and we also have an email that you can email. You can yeah email us um, Anti Litter Project BX at gmail .com. Yeah, and you guys just do. What, are you doing? You have something coming up that we can get involved in, or well, the season is kind of coming. Website. We'll, we'll put it on the website, and then we'll we'll, we'll send people there. Yeah, well, I, we definitely want people to come check out our Instagram and come check out what we do. But the events are kind of coming to a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a stop right now with the season change, winter coming. It's really brutal to be out there in the cold. And um, yeah. a couple of days ago, actually, and we, had a, we had a cleanup on the Willis Avenue Bridge and that went really well. So wow. we don't we don't want to shy people away, but we understand it's like once it gets warmer, yeah. we'll be more active. Trust me. Oh, we may have to get some boots on the ground and some shovels if it snows, right? <laughs> you spent last winter shoveling so much. I never shoveled so much in my life. I heard you. Yeah. So that's probably the transition. No one, because people put us up last minute when it when it snows, right? So we're always open to like helping people out. But that's what it was during the winter: salting and shoveling and breaking up the ice, helping people yeah. get out there. The parking spot. So, yeah. 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 You know, people back in the day, people used to pay you for that. Hey, here's about, here's a 20, you know, get, help me get this car out of here or, you know, help help my store, you know, shovel my sidewalk, you know, stuff like that. That's all. And even, yeah. even the leaves, you go to different neighborhoods, you can get people's, get a leaf blower, Maybe. help organize that, put that into plastic bags. I don't know that your, your foundation, anti litter project can do, can do a whole lot. Yeah, we're still pretty, pretty young in our development. You know, we haven't been around yeah. that long. We want to keep learning and keep growing and connecting with people and wanting to be the yeah. change we want to see and help others do the same. There and you go. The more we realize, like, the work that we do is needed. We're constantly um, emailed or DMs about, like, oh, there's trash in my neighborhood. Like, what do I do about it? Or how do I start my own cleanup effort? Or how do I partner up with you guys? you know, to clean up this area. So, and then also people are asking us about like permanent change. Cause like, mm -hmm. yeah, we can a lot, but how do we affect permanent change? So now we're working on some like workshops mm -hmm. and classes where we can dive into how to properly dispose of your trash. Cause Sexy brought up, like if you dispose of your trash, but you don't do it properly, it's never gonna get picked up. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for all that you guys are doing. Thank you for rolling up your sleeves and, and cleaning up our community. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. There she is, Jennifer Seda and Dexter Thomas Payne. We appreciate you. And the name Thank of the you. program is the Anti Litter Project. Go there, social media, and uh, donate to them or volunteer. You know, everybody out there moving together in the same direction for a common cause, cleaning up our neighborhoods. That's what it's all about. Reach out to some of the elected electeds too, the elected officials. They'll help you, and maybe they'll give you some discretionary funds to help you in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Anti-Littering Project. Thank you so much, Jennifer Seda and Dexter Thomas Payne. We appreciate you. We're going to take a break right here. Coming up next, Bobby C. with the latest in the world of sports. There's a lot going on. Stay tuned.
Our guest this morning is noted sports reporter and award-winning author, Gerald L. Hoover. Good morning, Professor. How are you, my friend? Been a long time. Good morning, Bobby Z. Good morning. Yes, it has too long, as a matter of fact, too long. I thought it was of, of interest to have you back here on the show because, of course, your book series has done so many amazing things for youngsters in the community. And uh, when I was you know, going back to look through things, I, I just can't believe that it's been so long, over 25 years since my friend, my hero uh, was was published. It celebrated 25 years in 2019. And and this process for you really has been a lifelong journey because it took you nine years to put that book together. You first started writing it when you were just 17 years old. Tell us a little bit uh, like an update about the series and, and in particular that book. Yeah, like I said, took nine years. Now, what's interesting, it didn't take nine years to finish it, right? It took nine years to get it from my head to the typewriter, back then typewriters, on into a publisher's hands where they would accept it. I got rejected over 40 times over when I started, I started in 1983, it got published in 92, right? So it was eight years once I, once I started sending the books out to publishers. Rejected for, I got rejected like four times, five times a year, <laughs> at least five times a year, over 40 times. Finally got hit in 92. And from there, BC, it just took off. And I was still doing a lot of stuff sort of out of the trunk, but the inroads I was making in schools, churches, uh, community-based organizations, the people that I met, and where I was able to take my career as a writer and other things. I met you because we started covering games. I became a sports writer, became an agile professor, and an lecturer, even though I stutter. So one of the things that I try to impart onto young people is that it's not where you start and even how you start, but just start. Because you never know how that flower, that seed can branch into, into many different facets of your life and it, make, it can make your life grand. And so I, I've been blessed to do it. And believe it or not, BC, when we published the 25th year anniversary, it was 2019 or 2018 or around that time, but we did it a couple of years late. So actually this time next year will be 30 years wow. because it got published in 92. So we'll be celebrating 30 years of the books being published. And now, so we went from My Friend, My Hero to He Was My Hero 2 to A Hopeful Hero. And now Hoop Hero will be out, I will, I, I will stay before March of next year. And the series itself too takes place in Mount Vernon. You're a local guy, grew up there. And uh, I know from, you know from having our friendship throughout the years that you've talked really about you know, not just producing a quality creative uh, book and content, but also really focusing in on promoting social and edu and emotional learning, I would say, for the students and, and to try to provide strategies for students in the classroom to to make better choices and to gain to gain that much needed confidence and to really support and unleash that inner greatness, which I think is what most teachers strive for. And, and to that your point, my, my buddy, I have a curriculum that goes with the book. So my friend, my hero, he was my hero too, and a hopeful hero all have a comprehensive curriculum, a student success guide, a teacher's edition to where the answers to the, the questions and so forth are in, are in, 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 in their version, and also have a student, uh, I'm sorry, a unit assessment, student unit assessments where the teachers or instructors can test the students at the beginning of the journey and then retest them again at the end to see the progress that they've made. And I don't doubt in my mind that students will make progress because one of the biggest compliments that I, I, I get is when a student, either, either is a struggling reader or a non-reader, will tell me, Mr. Hoover, uh, no disrespect, but I really, don't, I really don't like reading books, but I couldn't put your book down. Yeah, Gerald, I mean, it, it's ironic, too, because I, I often feel and it's such a privilege to be at Bronx Step because I feel like our mission statement at the station is to not only entertain, as you are doing with these books, but really to, to teach people and to inspire. We've been able to use sports as a platform really to, to try to educate uh, the masses and in particular young people uh, use some of these uh, stories uh, of really, like I said, inspiration and hope to try to to try to better our Bronx communities. And uh, I know from speaking to you as well, you know, one of the things that stood out for me with the book is 
that all, all four of these stories you, you have said might have initially been intended for young men of color, but you feel that they appeal to all races, all genders, and that they really were designed to inspire young students around the, you know, the age of 12 and up. Yes, and, and that, that was, the, that was the, the, the key component. And that is where I think publishers dropped the ball when it came out to not publishing me because I think they saw it as a black story. I'm like, not a black story. If you have a, a a person in your family that's an alcoholic or a drug addict or didn't finish school or whatever, that happens in all races, or or in and, and so does violence. You know what I mean? And and then teenagers. I mean, let's be honest, BC boys of different of, of every every persuasion that are teenagers we think crazy. We we we're teenagers. Girls can do the same thing. And but so when you're talking about trying to help guide young people, you're trying to do it across the board. And, and that's my my mission is books over bullets and literacy save lives because I really believe if you're thinking, I mean literally thinking, processing, analyzing, and being a, a critical thinker, you, know, you don't have time to be putting putting a gun in your hand trying to hurt somebody. You know you don't have time for all that. You want to do what you got to do and, and the right the righteous way and, and make something good of yourself. I totally agree, and I'm pretty sure that many people agree with you as well because. All the books, you know, uh, multiple awards, uh, even a semifinalist in the Gotham Screenplay Contest. And uh, recall uh, you getting that big award from former President Bill Clinton. Uh, some honor there. That, that, that was amazing. Uh, it was at uh, Central Park and it was me and it was several people. It was a bunch of us there. And it was, it was an awesome experience. Uh, it was America, America Cup Writing Award. And I even got a stipend, got some money and, uh, and, and it thought came to me, BC, and it still does, I started this journey writing on an ironing board, literally an ironing board, born in the Bronx, passing houses, 143rd Street, Mars Avenue. Uh, so, it, it, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bronx kid raising my learning, so I, I claim both, but to be able to write on an ironing board, the first nine drafts from start to finish, and I had the craziness in my mind to think I'm gonna be a published author one day, and, I probably didn't know what a published author was. I just knew they wrote books, you know. But I never forget one lady told me it was a, it was a, uh, one of my teachers. who actually became my mentor, her and her husband. She once told me she said, "Mr. Hoover, she was a white lady, uh, Italian." She said, "You're gonna make more of an impact than these kids than you think." I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "Well, you're not some dead white guy on the back of a cover." I'm like, "What do you mean by that?" She said, "Oh no, she said no. I don't know. No, what I mean by that is, is that they're gonna see you." as a young man, as a published author. And I said, oh, okay. And, but, but even, in, you know, our dead white guys, you know, uh, paved, paved the way for us, you know, Hemingway and all them kind of guys. Sure. But I knew what she meant. She meant it from a standpoint that when you go into a school or you go into a forum, you'll be able to see and touch these young men. And she became a prophetess because when I started going to schools, BC, one of the things that I would hear is, wow, I never met an author before. I never met an author before. And I'm like, wow. I said, Mr. Mitty was right. Miss Trotter, was, she ended up being getting married. I named Miss Trotter. I'm like, wow, she was right. And that, then, I, then I became more engrossed in what I was doing. Then when, when the kids started asking for autographs, I really got, what? Now, BC, we, we cover Nick games. So, so autographs is not something that <laughs> media guys you know, do. But when kids started seeing my cover, my face on the back of a cover, cover of the book, and they're like, wow, this is you? And that's when I knew that I can touch them and say certain things to them. That's when I knew I can say certain things to them. And then, of course, when I tell them the struggle of writing the way I did, uh, the, the eight years and so forth and so on, then the biggest thing that I get when I tell them that I was born with a speech impediment, I stutter. And, and I told them, I said, hey, I stutter, but I became a paid motivational speaker. I get paid to speak. They say, what, Mr. Hoover, you get paid? I say, yeah. When I get invited to a school, when I get invited to a forum or to, a, to give a lecture, what have you, I get paid. I just type it. I get money for it. How oh, you can do that? Yes, you can do that. If you read, write, and, and understand vocabulary, you can do all of that. Well, Gerald, congratulations on the latest chapter in this series and on, you know, inspiring for three decades now. Uh, for the fans at home, for more on the book series, they can visit theherobookseries.com. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Thank you, my man. And I appreciate seeing you and appreciate you having me.
When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I am the Doc Bob Lee for 107.5 WBLS, and you are watching Open, and we're having a good time. Hope you are. Our next guest is a violinist, and um, he's here to speak about the, his career as a musician and to keep us uh, plugged in on his latest work. He's doing some great things. So please welcome to the show, my G. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Doc Bob. Thanks for having me. We heard so much about you and all the wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, you may want to just drop it on us. How did you get started in, on this path to picking up the violin? <laughs> well, you know, I'm from I'm from New York, from the Bronx, grew up uh, in the area. And my older brother had picked up the fiddle and was studying at Harlem School of the Arts, where I ended up uh, kind of studying because everyone was studying there in my family. But I enjoyed what my, my brother was doing. I saw it. I loved the sound of it. And I just told my mom, I got, I got to play the violin. And so mom, this is it. Can you please get me a violin? Yeah. 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 I just, you know, my older brother was my hero also. So I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do what he's doing. And so that's, that's the, the long and short of it. I mean, the rest is history. I ended up finding myself uh, working, uh, you know, studying at home school, then going to Juilliard pre-college, and then eventually getting my uh, bachelor's degree at the Juilliard School, where I graduated in 2002. Yeah, and you you performed with a number of people, or lend your your career, not your career, but um, some of your expertise to some of their music, right? Uh, the Lost oh, Boys are here. You can name them. Absolutely, yeah. I've played uh, with a number of folks. I played with. Um, uh, one of the members of Lost Boys, I uh, played with um, ASAP Ferg, who's from Harlem. I've played uh, alongside um, Winton Marsalis. I've played with the LCJO, the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. I've done some yeah. things with uh, a number of folks. So, yeah, I've been blessed to do those things. And uh, hopefully more is in store. Of course. And, you know, Majid, you, you are 
you came across all genres. How did that feel? Which which genre like said, hey, you know, I want you to hang out with me for a little while longer. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, I'm in love with uh, American African American music in general. So I, I've you know grew up listening to in the home listening to. Um, jazz, been listening to the Isley Brothers. My my pop will put it on, and so it was in my soul. It was in my soul, so I would just play along with what I heard. And so the one that I enjoyed the most um, was jazz, but that's because jazz was so wide. It was so wide. It's a lot for me to explore. Of course, wow! You do so much with it. I had to do a paper on uh, jazz. I think uh, when I was doing my bachelor's, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, we took it all the way back to where it originated from. Oh, yeah. To, to, to what's happening now. Um, yeah. As you can see, I have a collection of uh, music behind me. Um, yes. And, and that has a lot of that has a lot of genres in it also, because, you you know, when you do a lot of uh, weddings and stuff. But I don't want to talk about me. You have to or play for a lot of different people. You have to be up on all of those uh, genres of music. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you describe your style? of music because you know a lot of people play the violin but they don't play it like you sure um the kind of style that i um i would describe myself as having is uh is certainly um i guess it's a fusion of uh, hip-hop a fusion of rock um obviously it's jazz but it also has heavy classical influence as well so i'm playing a lot um on the fiddle but while I'm doing, I'm making sure I'm grooving. So it it has a lot of like rock and uh, and hip hop influences because that's kind of what I also was growing up with as a kid. I enjoyed rock. I enjoy hip hop. You know, I'm from the Bronx. You know, it's the birth of birthplace of hip hop. So it, it came from where? The Bronx. That's right. <laughs> the BX Borough. <laughs> yes, indeed. Hey, hey listen. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about trap jazz because you know you specialize in this, right? Where did it come from, and you know how did you get involved in it? Well, you know, trap jazz came about uh, uh, in the sense that uh, I'd like to mix. I I like to mix um, current forms of music. It's, I don't just play trap jazz. This is something that I kind of started doing as one of the many hats that I wear. But um, not a lot of people found themselves doing it. So you would uh, now it's more prevalent, but. Uh, four or five years ago, it wasn't really a thing, but I would, uh, I would play modern jazz tunes or my own originals. And I would always have the trap drums under it. And I would have the, the more modern bass, which would uh, allow for it to sound more current and more uh, appealing to just, you know, the average Joe that's out there just listening to music. And they would say, ah, oh, that's that trap violin, that trap violin. And I said, yeah, it's trap jazz because I'm improvising on it. So. Yeah. But just some of the places where you played um, and what stood out in your mind as one of your favorite places and where would you like to play next where you haven't played? Sure. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite places that I've played, I've enjoyed um, great success in that space is um, uh, a place called National Sawdust down in Brooklyn. I've played there and I've had many sold out shows there, thankfully. And uh, the vibration in the house. All right. Yes, indeed. The vibration is just really right there. You know, I like it. Um, the people are kind. The, the room is nice. And it's also not too big a room. It's a strange uh, rectangular room where the stage is kind of across the room, but the audience is also across the room, but it's not deep. So you can kind of touch folks very directly. You can see the folks who you're playing with. You can shout folks out directly. I enjoy that yeah, space. Cool. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> so a place where I'd like to play um, to continue the question um, is that, you know, I haven't played. I, I've played in Carnegie Hall. I've played in Alice Tully Hall. I've played in all of the, I've played in Birdland. I've played in all this, but I've yet to play at the Blue Note. And I'm looking for an opportunity oh, to play yeah. at the Blue Note. Yeah, I mean... I'm looking for an opportunity to play at the Blue Note because I'm sure the audiences would love me there. And it's such a legendary space. Yeah. I really want to, I want to make it out to the Blue Note. So that's Blue a Blue Note. Like play. Get Majid a call. Blue Note? Yes. Blue Note call. Majid. That's right. And I'm answering the phone. What about the world-famous Apollo Theater? 
I have oh. played that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've played there. I played that several times um, because my family's from Harlem. So, and I went to the Harlem School of the Arts. So we would play as a kid. I would play there like at least once a year. So I played there four or five times, six times, something like this. Um, I, pro- I played there professionally as well. Um, you know, on in, in in different folks' bands, things of that nature. So I've done Apollo. It's a great place, great space, yeah. legendary. Listen, where are you going to perform next? And uh, where can we go to find out more about you? You got a website? Yes, indeed. You can go uh, and find me at Majid Violin, www.majidviolin.com. That's my website. Or you can just find me on uh, the web at uh, or Instagram at God Violin. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at God Violin is my handle at God Violin. And on YouTube, yep, on YouTube is Majid Violin. And thanks once again to the uh, Bullion Foundation with Sandra DaCosta and the crew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. Majid, the violinist, he's got it going on. Thank you so much. He's a violinist, composer, and band leader. We appreciate you, man. Love you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Dr. Bob. You got it. All right, that's about it for everything that we're doing today. But uh, keep it right here. We'll catch you another day, another way. Always remember this, what you are is God's gift to you. And what you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice and let your choice control the chooser. For all of us here at Bronx, have a great and enjoyable day. And uh, we love you all. Peace. <laughs>